Happy Monday, everybody. Every Monday I go over my uh, meta review for best of one, best of three in standard. And every once in a while I'll include a budget deck if I find one. Uh, this week we're going to start things off with the tournament winners from the standard challenge on Moto, which I think is a really good tournament to follow to kind of track what's going on in best of three. So there was a lot more mono red uh, aggro in best of three this week than we've seen in the past. Um, first place was taken down by Demir Midrange by Tyism, and was the same exact list as I covered in week 8 of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. I've decided to keep this one called, <laughs> I'm just going to do this one as week 9 of OTJ because Modern Horizons 3 didn't really affect standard play at all. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're going to get out a, a couple of weeks more than we usually do um, until the rotation of Bloomborough on August 2nd. Um, Second place was taken down by Mono Red Aggro by De Leon 91 and um, it was the same list as the one that I covered in week 6 of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. There was a slight change in the best of three sideboard. We saw uh, two Soul Guide Lanterns got dropped for an uh, extra copy of a Furnace Punisher and one more copy of In the Festivities uh, to really hurt on Boros Convoke. So uh, this one is actually the third place list, um, Mono Red Aggro by Brunin Ho. And if we compare this one to the list I covered in week six of Outlaws of Thunder Junction, we can see that they dropped the four copies of the Phoenix Chick, as well as the three copies of Squee, Dubious Monarch, going for less of a board presence. Brought in two additional copies of the Charming Scoundrel, which can help you trigger prowess by creating the Wicked Roll, attaching it to a creature. You can create a treasure token to it hit the higher part of your curve. Or if you have no cards in hand, you can discard a card to draw a card. And um, as far as the spells go, they dropped the Obliterating Bolt and the two copies of the Witch Stalker Frenzy and brought in two, cop two additional copies of Play With Fire and the fourth copy of Lightning Strike. So we have more direct burn. Three copies of the Scorching Shot. So it doesn't exile like Obliterating Bolt does, but it deals five damage instead of four. And then um, we're leaning more heavily on the Urbrask's Forge to eventually overwhelm our opponent. So more burn, more removal, more interaction, less of a creature presence, and uh, relying more on the Urbrask's Forge. As far as the sideboard goes, we do see some changes as well. So they dropped two copies of the Soul Guide Lantern, which, uh, like I mentioned, was the only change that we saw in the list that took down the second place. And um, moved the Urbrask's Forge from the sideboard to the main and brought in one copy of the Unlicensed Hearse for the Graveyard Hate Against Teamer Control or the Teamer Landfall deck, as well as four color or five color legends. The Slogurk decks uh, both really like their Graveyard, so you'd be bringing that one in. And then we've got Koth Fire of Resistance, which gives us some Planeswalkers if you're bumping into a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the board, a lot of the Wraths don't hit Planeswalkers. Um, so like your, your temporary lockdowns, your depopulates, your sunfalls, um, which Urbrask's Forge kind of gets around in the first place. And then we've got the Elder Dragon War, which we've seen being explored as a way to deal the two damage to Boros Convoke. So even if they have the War Leader's Call and have increased everything to two toughness, we can still wrath their board. And then it uh, allows us to do some excellent dig if we're flooding by discarding cards and then drawing that many. And then on the third chapter, it creates a 4-4 Dragon token with flying. So there's also a second version of the standard challenge 32 and this one first place was taken down by Demir Midrange by CCO Gire. And if we compare this one to week eight of Outlaws of Thunder Junction, so just last week, um, we can see that a kind of return to the original build of Demir Midrange. So we've dropped the two, co two copies of Caustic Bronco, the Tenacious Underdog, the Graveyard Trespassers, as well as the Tide Tidebinders, and brought in the four copies of the Spyglass Siren, which works really well with the two additional copies of Gix Yogman Praetor to get you to take advantage of the early evasion of your flyers like Fairy Mastermind and Deep Cavern Bat to be able to give us card draw and win through outvaluing our opponent that way. And then we've got four copies of the Preacher of the Schism. And uh, I really like this one of the four toughness. I think it's really good against Mono Red specifically. And we saw a lot more Mono Red in the best of three tournament scene. Um, so that one being brought in here. And additionally, another copy of Urtai Resurrected. And this one works with the Fairy Mastermind because when you make them draw a card by countering a spell or destroying a creature, um, if they draw their second card, then you do, you do as well. So it kind of offsets the negativity of Urtai Resurrected is a nice synergy. 
And then uh, we've dropped the two copies of Liliana the Veil, which is really good against the Golgari midrange and the Azorius control matchup. And we dropped the two copies of Duress, which is also really good against Azorius control. So a couple of signs here that the pilot was anticipating less control matchups. Um, also dropped a Spell Pierce, uh, brought in an additional copy of Make Disappear. And then as far as the lands go, we dropped one copy of the Myrix in lieu of, and brought in an Island. So as far as the best of three sideboard goes, they dropped the cut down, um, the two copies of Dreams of Steel and Oil, uh, one copy of Negate, and the two copies of the Unlicensed Hearse, so still keeping one Unlicensed Hearse and one Negate. Um, but to bring in uh, an uh, one copy of Spell Pierce in the sideboard, and one additional copy of Disdainful Stroke. This one, again, being really good against... It's okay against Boros Convoke because you can hit Knight Errant of Eos, and then it's really good for the Sunfall and, and um, any of the ones that are running the Mana Valley 4 or greater kind of Wraths. And we're also bringing in one copy of Blot Out, and this one's really good for the Mirror Match with the Aklazots, being able to exile it so that it doesn't keep coming back as a recurring threat. And then it's usually the highest costed mana value among what your opponent controls. Um, we also see Liliana being brought in as a sideboard. So instead of being in the main, bringing it into this uh, sideboard, so you bring it in during the matches where it is advantageous. I think really this is where like Liliana the Veil can struggle against like Boros Convoke. Um, any of the go wide strategies where attacking their hand and then making them sacrifice a token isn't really important. And then um, mono against mono red, it's less important um, just because you want to be survive you know Liliana doesn't really give you really great board presence and as long as they have cheap little things to sacrifice then Liliana is is worse so um, might be because of expecting more mono red and then um bringing in the two two additional Tashana's tide binders into the sideboard instead of in the main and this one again is particularly good against the activated abilities of planeswalkers so I know it's good against Azorius control um there's a couple of other matchups where it's it's kind of useful um can be okay against hitting something like imidane's recruiter or the um knight errant eos against boros convoke as well and second place was taken down by orsav midrange by arianne and arianne's a familiar name if you follow the uh, magic the gathering online tournament scene usually an esper midrange pilot and um, we're, I think we're really going to see Esper midrange kind of morphing into Orsov midrange as we get closer to rotation. And um, so if we compare this one to week seven, so two weeks ago, we do see some slight changes. So uh, we've dropped one copy of the Tenacious Underdog, um, dropped two copies of the Shielder of the Apocalypse, dropped the two copies of Invasion of Gobicon, which is really good against the other uh, midrange decks by affecting their tempo. So... I do have the um, sideboard guide where I talk about the cards specifically, and I do remember that one off the top of my head. Um, as far as the Planeswalkers go, we were running a fair amount. So uh, we're running four copies of the Wandering Emperor and um, still got the Liliana and the Sorin of Mirthless, uh, bringing the four copies of Duress up to four. So maybe <laughs> getting mixed signals about whether or not uh, Azorius Control was an anticipated matchup. Um, but uh, bringing in two copies of the Virtue of Loyalty. So we've kind of seen this like classic wedding announcement in Virtue of Loyalty build in Esper midrange where you're just trying to swarm the board and then eventually overwhelm your opponent. And what's really cool about this build is that it can kind of flip from being uh, relatively aggressive into more of a control shell based off of the Planeswalkers. So I do think that this is going to be a really interesting archetype to watch going forward. Um, as far as the lands go, we dropped two Mishra's Foundries and a Shadowy Backstreet to bring in two copies of Myrix and um, one copy of the Restless Fortress and one Swamp. So I think that with the Mishra's Foundry getting pulled out and the Myrix brought in, as well as the Duress, that Ariane was at least anticipating maybe a little bit more of a control matchup. And then in Best of Three, uh, in the Best of Three sideboard, we can see um, they dropped the Lauren of the Third Path and brought in a hostile and uh, two copies of Hostile Investigator. And Hostile Investigator is another one that's really good against Azorius Control, making them discard. And um, dropped the one copy of Duress from the sideboard because we brought it into the main. Uh, dropped one copy of Get Lost, as well as the three copies of Path of Peril um, and the two copies of Pest Control. 
So definitely not anticipating as much of a uh, Boros Convoke matchup in the be in, in the tournament, and uh, dropping two copies of the Unlicensed Hearse for the Graveyard Hate, and bringing in the one additional copy of Cutdown for more mono red, uh, two copies of Knockout Blow also for mono red, and one Legions to Ashes, which I think is a way to uh, uh, hate on Boros Convoke without you know pest control being a card that's uh, kind of a bit of a whiff or path of peril being able to you know hit hits resets our board as much as it does theirs um and instead we're going to be running the classic temporary lockdown for against boros convoke and then one copy of depopulate and i, I think this one is for if you're coming up more against like the um demir midrange or the golgari midrange where they've got more things that the temporary lockdown doesn't hit being able to give yourself kind of a reset button and then gix's command the versatility of gix's command is amazing i'm a big fan of this card um being able to give yourself lifelink if you need to stabilize being able to wipe the board if you're up against a, a board flood strategy or being able to just return creature cards from your graveyard to your hand if you're up against a control situation um, just a really nice card to have in certain matchups. And the last best of three deck that I'm going to cover this week is Golgari Midrange, which took down third place by Hermano MLG. And we can see that they dropped the uh, Tranquil Frillback from the main, as well as two copies of Arch uh, Archfiend of the Dross, which works pretty well against Mono Red. So with as much Mono Red as we saw, I was actually kind of surprised to see that they decided to cut the Archfiend of the Dross. And uh, they dropped the two copies of the Hostile Investigator. Again, that one's particularly good against the control matchups. And brought in an additional copy of Caustic Broncos, bringing that one all the way up to four. And uh, bringing in an additional copy of Kervik the Punisher, so that we can reloop some of our black removal. And brought in one copy of Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal, giving you nice stabilization if you can make it to five. And then uh, Harvester of Misery, which is one that we haven't really seen a lot. Um, other creatures get minus two, minus two, kind of helps you with the Boros Convoke matchup. And um, as far as the Planeswalkers go, we can see that they dropped one copy of Liliana of the Veil, vale, as well as dropped Nissa, uh, Ascended Animus, to bring in Soren the Mirthless, which uh, gives you more of that like lifelink stabilization instead of the overrun effect of getting over your opponents. Um, so better against aggro, worse against midrange. And um, as far as the uh, interaction goes, we dropped a Cutdown, a Bitter Triumph, and the two Gixes command to bring in an additional copy of Duress, and two copies of Go for the Throat, so bringing that one up to four. And also giving some alternative dig, which I thought was kind of interesting, was exploring one copy of Pillage the Bog, as well as one copy of Analyze the Pollen, both being able to kind of give you uh, a good tutor effect or, or dig effect. And um, one additional copy of Shoot the Sheriff. As far as the best of three, uh, oh, and sorry, for the lands, we dropped the Field of Ruin, the Underground Mortuary to bring in Boseju, who endures, and a Swamp, and dropped one Cavern of Souls. As far as the best of three sideboard goes, we can see that um, they dropped the Akalazot's Deepest Betrayal because they brought it into the main, uh, brought in two additional copies of the Tranquil Frillback, and um, this one being a particularly nice one against being able to attack your opponent's graveyard if you're against team or landfall or against the uh, Slogurk decks. You can also bring it in for life stabilization against mono red. And then you can bring it in for enchantment hate against like Boros Convoke um, if they're running the four copies of the Case of the Gateway Express and the four copies of the War Leader's Call. It's particularly good in that matchup, as well as any of the Esmer midrange or Orsov midrange that is running Virtue of Loyalty and Wedding Announcement. And um, cut the one copy of Cease and Desist, Deadly Cover-Up, Extract the Truth, Outrageous Robbery, Path of Peril, and the Cruelty of Gix, which were all one-ofs that were being explored in um, week six of Outlaws of Thunder Junction um, by the previous tournament winner. And instead, we're running an additional copy of Terra Sunder. So we're starting to see the sideboard get a little bit more focused. And, um, and we're running two copies of Liliana of the Veil, vale, in, um, so we can bring this all the way up to four if it's a it's a good matchup to bring in Lily. Again, I really like Lily in the um, mirror match and the uh, control matchups. And then two copies of the Gix's Command. Again, really good versatility. Good against Boros Convoke for wiping the board. Good for giving the lifelink stabilization. Um, and <laughs> yeah, just, just all around a lot of really good versatility from Gix's Command. 
And now for best of one, and we I was expecting to see some stagnation in best of one, and uh, because we didn't get any new cards from Modern Horizons 3, um, but we're actually going to see substantial changes happening to all top eight archetypes in best of one. And so really what we're seeing is like a, um, like I mentioned last week, the prowess, the, the mono red prowess deck is really shifting things up. Slickshot is demanding that more decks are running um, a strategy to account for for Slickshot show off. And so we're saying we're seeing a shift in the meta to kind of adapt to the mono red prowess decks. And we're actually seeing mono red prowess drop quite a bit in its win rate this week. And um, so Mono White Humans has been number one for a while. It's a really solid deck. We are going to lose a lot of the key pieces like Adeline and Brutal Cathar. And, uh, you know, it, it's definitely not rotation proof. So keep that in mind. If you are new to Magic the Gathering and returning to Magic the Gathering, we're going to see a, a large meta shift in about, you know, one and a half months in, on August 2nd. Um, so don't <laughs> craft with with care. If uh, if you do craft, know that it could be it could be gone here in in two months. Um, that, that being said, though, uh, Mono White Humans is one of my favorites for climbing the ladder. Um, we're dropping the three copies of the Hopeful Initiate and the two copies of Warden of the Inner Sky and the Spellbook Vendor, as well as the Werefox Bodyguard, and one copy of the Knight Errant of Eos to bring in an, an additional copy of the Recruitment Officer, two copies of Skrelv. So this is kind of what I was talking about with, like, if, if we're going to see more interaction, single uh, instant speed, single point interaction being brought in for Mono Red Prowess, then it makes sense to run Skrelv because Skrelv then can protect your Thalia and your Coppercoat Vanguard from that interaction that's being brought in for the other deck. Um, and we're also bringing in two more copies of the Intrepid Adversary. Being able to protect Intrepid Adversary with Skrelv allows you to really play this out on turn two. Um, ideally, you want to save it for turn four where you get the additional plus one plus one for your entire board. Um, but the this can be a really good, uh, this can be a problem for Mono Red Prowess because they'll have to shoot your Skrelv and then you can get in for some lifelink and get out of range of their one turn kill. Um, and then we're seeing uh, Thalia coming in again for more instant speed interaction, making them uh, tax them. And then we've got the Sanguine Evangelist, which gives you this kind of really sticky threat where, um, as well as a board pump, is kind of like the Imodane's Recruiter for Mono White. And um, if it gets destroyed, it comes back as a 1-1 bat. So it gives you some flying ev evasive flyers as well that can kind of help gum up against the, the Mono Red Prowess, um, being able to just like chump block if they don't have trample. It's a little thin, but it works sometimes. And then uh, we're bringing in an additional copy of the Ossification. And as far as the lands go, we've dropped one copy of a Gonjo, Seed of the Empire. We'll see this one kind of fluctuate between one and two. And then um, one copy of Mishra's Foundry instead of the Myrix that was being run. So um, less control in the in the scene right now and moving more towards just a, uh, pressuring our opponent. And then brought in two additional planes. This graphic is kind of all messed up right now, huh? <laughs> anyway, um, second place by according to Untapped, which is the tracker that I like to use uh, to track best of one data over thousands of matches. And uh, number two was Boros Heroic. And uh, I haven't talked about this one in best of one since week four of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And um, so we do see some changes since I talked about it last. Uh, we see that they've dropped the four copies of the Fugitive Codebreaker to bring in two copies of the Picnic Ruiner and uh, dropped two copies of the Kumano Faces Kakazan, so just dropping that entirely from the list, as well as uh, three copies of Play With Fire and the four copies of the Demonic Ruckus, and leaning more into the Angel Fire Ignition. Again, remember that the uh, this, these cards are going to be rotating out in, on August 2nd, so if you do craft this, craft it with care. And um, we've got four copies of the Blessed Defiance, which allows us to get some lifelink, which is particularly nice against the Mono Red Prowess decks. And then uh, we've got two copies of the Felonious Rage, which can work really nicely with the Picnic Ruiner, being able to immediately give it the double strike and uh, haste. And then we've got Twin Inferno, which if you know this has already got double strike, this has already got double strike, and um, but Slickshot Show Off doesn't. <laughs> so Twin Inferno being able to hit for a ton of damage if you give it double strike. And then as far as the lands go, we're dropping three copies of the Sundown Pass, which is the uh, Boros Slow Land and bringing in two mountains and two more planes. 
Number three was Boros Convoke. And if we compare this one to week seven of Outlaws of Thunder Junction, we can see that they dropped the two copies of Lunark Veteran, which is uh, against mono red aggro and mono red prowess can give you a lot of life gain in this deck because you're really like flooding the board with a lot of tokens. And um, we're dropping the Regal Bunnycorn, which if you go back and you look at my best of three sideboard guides, Regal Bunnycorn is good against some matchups, not so good against others. It really depends on how good they are at, re at resetting the board. Um, Thing when Evangelist, we're dropping one copy there and bringing in one copy of the Ocean Frontliner kind of see this kind of come and go is like you're either running the Lunark Veterans or you're running the Ocean Frontliner. Sometimes you see both. And then uh, but we're bringing in the four copies of the case of the Gateway Express. And this one you kind of this Boros Convoke is a nice one to read signals for best of one meta, um, because when it's all case of the Gateway Express, you know, there's less control. And then when it's all War Leaders Call, you know there's more control. <laughs> and so when you have both, which is what we see a lot of times in Best of Three, um, you know there's kind of an equal split between Azorius Control and best and um, and the Mono Red Aggro decks. So trying to cover both bases here this week. And as far as the lands go, we dropped two copies of the Cavern of Souls. I really like that one because um, it, it can cause some awkward turns where your your Gleeful Demolition you can't cast because this is colorless unless it's the creature type that you're playing. Uh, so especially if you're going to be running the War Leader's Call and the Case of the Gateway Express, more the more non-creature spells you're going to be running than the less Cavern of Souls that you want to have. And then um, dropping the sun, one copy of the Sundown Pass, which again is the Boros Slowland. Really don't like that card. <laughs> I'm really happy that we got the Inspiring Bandage. And then um, dropping one planes, bringing in a second copy of a Ganjo Seat of the Empire and a second copy of Sokinzon Crucible of Defiance and one mountain. And they can be a little bit awkward when you have the two legendary lands in hand and you have to like tap it and then play one out and replace the other one. Um, but it also helps you kind of solve out uh, problems if you're flooding. And uh, so we, 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 we see this kind of fluctuate between one and two copies. So if you're new, new and you're wondering whether or not you should craft one or two, I really think you can just get by with using one. And good old Rakdos Aggro, which is really a lot like the Slickshot Pro, uh, Show Off deck with um, Mono Red Prowess. Um, <laughs> Uh, but basically being Rakdos because we have the Kallus Sellsword to be able to fling it at our opponent. The adventure side is red, so we don't even need to have any black mana. And um, so it's it's a little bit of a stretch to um, call this one entirely a different archetype. And that's kind of why I made that video about Slickshot Showoff being somewhat of a problem in the meta. Because like Boros Heroic is running it in, in red-white. Uh, you've got in the Gruel Combat Tricks, you see Slickshot Showoff. You see it in Rakdos Prowess. You see it in Mono Red Prowess. Um, Slickshot Show Off is just being a very popular card right now and uh, it's doing quite good stuff. Um, less less good stuff than we've seen, though. We're starting to see it come down a little bit, which is good. Um, nice to see it balance a little bit. So number four was Rakdos Aggro. And if we compare this one to last week, we can see just a few changes. So we're, this one is just deciding to drop the Kenra Spell Spear and run two additional copies of Felden Ronan Excavator instead. Uh, this kind of giving us Less of a prowess um, payoff, but more dig if our opponent has to block the Felden Ronum Excavator. And then we're dropping two copies, or one copy of the Antagonize down to three, and one copy of the Mirren Bane Splitter down to two. This one works particularly well with permanently making the Picnic Ruiner have a power four. So if you drop more Picnic Ruiners, then you're going to want to adjust the amount of Bane Splitters that you have. And then we're bringing in one Sokinzon, Crucible of Defiance, to bring the land count up to 18. Number five, according to Untapped, was Mono Red Aggro. And last week we saw kind of um, a blending of Mono Red Prowess and Mono Red Aggro. And now we're starting to see that kind of separate out again. Um, Mono Red Aggro is actually doing better this week than Mono Red Prowess, at least according to the tracker, between Bronze and Mythic. Um, so we're, we're seeing the Fugitive Codebreakers got dropped, the Slickshot Showoffs got dropped, which are going to be in the prowess decks and instead we're running the kind of the classic uh, bloodthirsty adversaries coming back in with two there uh two copies of the charming scoundrel and two copies of felden ronum excavator and two additional copies of godric cloaked reveler and one additional copy of squee dubious monarch and we're dropping one copy of the monstrous rage and two copies of the herb Rask's forge and three copies of the Witchstalker Frenzy. And we're seeing my good old friend Nahiri's Warcrafting. Um, this one working, having better synergies than Witchstalker Frenzy with the Bloodthirsty Adversary. 
And uh, as far as the lands go, we're dropping, or we're bringing in one more uh, copy of Mishra's Foundry, dropping one Sokanzons, and bringing in two additional mountains. So really uh, quickly, the the reason why Mono Red Aggro is doing better than Mono Red Prowess now is because Mono Red Aggro is better against the single point uh, spot removal. So. Um, some of these, you know, like squeeze a little bit more of a sticky threat, a recurring threat, and it goes a little bit later in the curve. That's why we need more mana um, than the prowess decks. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if you are a mono red fan, you might actually see a return to the mono red aggro, at least for the little bit, as everybody um, over adjusts for the mono red prowess deck. And speaking about mono red prowess, it was in the top eight, so now it has dropped all the way down to number six. Um, if we compare this one to last week, we do see some changes. So we see Godric Cloaked Reveler coming up to four. Um, some lists don't run the Godric Cloaked Reveler and just cap out at the Slickshot show off and go for an ultra low land count. Um, Godric Cloaked Reveler is good against certain matchups. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's better against the Azorius Control matchup and um, Mono Red and against the Mirror match. Worse against Boros Convoke. Um, Again, this, I might be wrong on that one, but that, that's what I remember off the top of my head. So we, we see Godric kind of come and go, right? So keep that one in mind if you are thinking about crafting him. He is going to be around for a while, though, with Wilds of Eldraine uh, not rotating out for a while. Um, we're dropping the one copy of Shock and bringing um, in two copies of the Witch Stalker Frenzy. And this can be re this can be useful against... Um, in the mirror match, when you when your opponent is attacking you with a bunch of prowess, being able to then instantly remove their slick shot show off can be the kind of deciding factor in that matchup. So not surprised to see the Witch Talker Frenzies coming in here to give us a little bit more of the instant speed interaction, since the shock can be kind of avoided if you hit this with a monstrous rage. It gets three toughness and then it doesn't work as well as the frenzy. Um, as far as the lands go, we do see that they dropped a mountain and one Sokanzons. So the previous list was running 20, which I do think is too high for this deck, even if you are running the Godric Cloak Revelers. Um, I do think you could run a Sokanzon Crucible of Defiance, though. I don't think you necessarily need to cut that, even when you're running a low land count like 18. Occasionally, you still get flooded. Number seven, according to Untapped, was Domain. And we actually haven't seen Domain in the top eight in best of one in a long time. Uh, we saw it. Uh, quite quite a bit in Murders at Karlov Manor in Best of Three. And so I have to go all the way back to week four of Murders at Karlov Manor. It was the last time that I talked about Domain specifically in Best of One. So we definitely see some changes to the archetype. So uh, they've dropped the Topiary Stompers and the Archangel of Wrath and brought in an additional copy of Atraxa Grand Unifier and one copy of the Imidane's Recruiter. And um, this one was... Uh, told to me that it was a, a, a like a just a random inclusion by um Eldrazi um uh, can't remember what uh his his name I'm Ali Eldrazi and um this one allows you to give everything haste off of your uh herd migrations so you can kind of get this it works really well in the archetype as one of <laughs> so that one's uh coming in from that change in best of 3 long ago and then uh, we're dropping the Invasion of Zendikar, so less of the ramp Topiary Stomper quickly being able to flip the Invasion of Zendikar. And we're leaning a little bit more heavily into life gain for stabilization. So you're always going to see changes in from the best of three meta um, when adapting for best of one because you have a different meta. You're going to bump into a lot more mono red and a lot more aggression. So Teferi, who slows the sunset, being able to give you two life a turn is quite relevant. And then it's also a body that Mono Red might feel like they have to attack instead of you. And uh, so this can kind of gain you six life for four if they choose to attack the Planeswalker, um, or even more actually, uh, seven life. Um, so pretty good against that matchup. And then um, previously, the domain deck was really set up to, to utilize a lot of black interaction to have that instant speed spot removal. And so we're going to see a lot of that being removed. So Courier, Courier's Briefcase was is particularly good against Mono Red Aggro, not Mono Red Prowess, where the 1-1 one, one chump block is actually necessary to stay alive until you hit your, into your Sunfalls. Um, but we're going to see that Courier's Briefcase get dropped as well as the Go for the Throats and the Virtue of Persistence. Uh, we're bringing the up the beanstalks back up to four. This one really depends on um, if you're 
it really depends on how much the card advantage matters. Um, it's going to help you outvalue control, for example, worse uh, against mono red aggro. And then um, we're bringing in the two copies of the Depopulate to be able to give us a cheaper uh, Sunfall um, that we can hit a turn sooner. And then um, we're also bringing in the four copies of the Lightning Helix, which is really going to be the stabilization against the early aggression. And then we're also bringing in the one copy of the Celestis, which has synergies with Teferi, who slows the sunset. Again, where that life gain is particularly relevant. And then we're also bringing in the four copies of the Ancient Cornucopia. I think you're going to see this as be a, a staple going forward for the domain because it helps you fix with the uh, one mana of each color. Remember that the um, Triome lands are going to be rotating out in August 2nd, so it's possible domain will not survive rotation. Time will tell. And then... Um, as far as I, I didn't complete my thought here, um, the reason why it's going to work well in the four color and five color space is you gain one life for each of that spell's color. So when you're doing like Lightning Helix, this gains you five life instead of three if you have the Ancient Cornucopia in play. And then like Atraxa gains you four life on ETB as well as the lifelink uh, that it has naturally. Um, can, this can really help you stabilize against the pressure of aggro. And um, as far as the lands go, though, we see a complete rework of the lands to reflect the removal of black. So uh, we've got like one less forest, two less Myrix, two less Spars headquarters, two swamps, uh, two less Zeator's proving grounds to bring in two plains, two mountain or one mountain, four cavern of souls, one Rafine's tower. And last but not least, we've got Azorius Control, and this one's was this one's one that we see a lot in um, in Best of Three. At that, at the, also we see a lot of in Best of One. Again, you're going to see slight variations. Usually, this is going to be more heavily teched against the early pressure for Best of One than it is in Best of Three. Um, so, if we compare this one to last week, we do see some changes, not too many. So, we've dropped one copy of the Wandering Emperor to bring in an additional copy of Jace the Perfected Mind, allowing us to mill as an alternative win condition rather than just leaning on the Wandering Emperor and the Manlands of Restless Anchorage to deal damage to the opponent. Um, as f we're also going to drop the one copy of Destroy Evil, which I thought was kind of out of place. Um, and drop one copy of the Farewell. Again, Farewell being better if the uh, Graveyard Hate is more relevant uh, because we've seen so much mono red prowess i'm not surprised to see it go because it is one more expensive than sunfall to cast and then um we're bringing in two more copies of get lost i'm a really big fan of get lost i think the map tokens are problematic in some matchups um but against aggro especially not going to be that bad so really great for best of one and then uh, we're dropping a Plains and a Sunken Citadel for an Island and a Meticulous Archive, which is the Azorius Surveil land that can kind of help us filter to uh, the card that we need. So uh, remember to hit like and subscribe if you like this sort of thing. I try to do one of these meta reviews every Monday. i um, going to keep calling it Outlaws of Thunder Junction, even though Modern Horizons 3 is out because it feels like it's Outlaws of Thunder Junction still. <laughs> and... Um, I also do some gameplay videos, so throughout the week I'll try to, to showcase some of my um, just fun explorations in Best of One. And then every Sunday I do a off-meta um, review of some of these some of the decks that aren't on this list, and um, then hold a poll that you guys can vote on, so vote for your favorite matchup, uh, or favorite uh, deck that you would like to see, and I'll showcase those on Saturdays. So if you're new here to my community, welcome. And uh, good luck with your matches and crushing it on the ladder. And I'll see you. I'll see you later.